Um, thanks for the introduction, and uh, thanks everyone for being here uh, during the lunch time. Today, I'm, make, uh, I'm representing informatics group to make a report on this AO space project, which is also my thesis project, Spatial Radiogenomics Assessment of Breast Cancer Hydrogenity. There are four major parts of my talk today. In the first part, I'm going to make a proposal. In the second section, I'm going to make a report on my progress and uh, share several of my preliminary results. And in the future section, I'm going to list all my plans. And the last one is a summary section. Uh, the first section is opportunity. In this section, I'm going to explain to you why we are doing this project, what kind of question did we ask, and how did we approach to the answers. Our research object is breast cancer. Just as all other types of carcinomas, they all start with a normal cell. So uh, here is our model, a normal cell in a breast. And at some point, this normal cell acquired driver mutations. Of course, the, uh, the immune system failed to respond and they forms a tumor. And then as time goes by, this tumor evolves, grows, and finally gets noticeable to the patient. After that, the patient will ask for medical help. At the time of diagnosis, this tumor is not a consistent object. It's a mass full of variabilities, and that's what we call the intratumor heterogeneity. And the intratumor heterogeneity is not only describing the differences among cancer cells, it also related to uh, spatial distribution of the tumor, especially in breast cancer, which could be multifocal or multicentric. So multifocal breast cancer means that the tumor has spatially distinct locations, but they stay within the same quadrant of the breast. And multicentric breast cancer means that the tumor just distributed everywhere more than one quadrant, and we cannot just singly um, take one cut and took all the tumor out at once. So um, next, I'm going to explain to you how uh, the current diagnostic procedure looks like for breast cancer and how was it confounded by intratumor hydrogenity. So generally speaking, the patient would firstly go through a imaging technology. And then after that, uh, the physicians would take biopsies out of the tissue and then perform molecular profiling. And then after that, the treatment plan was given out based on the molecular profiling from that single needle biopsy. And um, let's say this is our multicentric breast cancer patient. It's a, a pseudo example, it's not realistic. Um, let's say we are lucky enough that we got the most representative part of the tumor, which is this one. By that, I mean this biopsy contains the most representative genotype among all of these four. What would likely happen next is that we gave out a treatment plan and then we killed off all the subclones in this biopsy, but we still have two subclones left, which could cause relapse in the future. And that's what I would say the limitation of current diagnostic procedure for breast cancer. But under the scope of radiological imaging, and that's the only way we can get a fuller and unbiased view of heterogeneity for the whole tumor, which could lead us to a more precise treatment plan. So at this point, we are questioning whether we can find radiomics biomarker to replace molecular profiling based on the biopsy. Here's our approach. So before I introduce our uh, data cohort, I would like to talk a little bit on the experimental setup. Because of our experimental setup, we would have high dimensional and uh, multiomics data type. So that I set up two aims. The first one is here, is trying to understand heterogeneity on multiomics level independently. And then the second aim would be trying to integrate multiomics level data with imaging data. Without fully understanding of heterogeneity on each level, we won't be able to do anything on the superficial imaging level. So here is our data. This is GINA cohort. Um, it was developed by one of our collaborators, Dr. Martin Yaffe at Sandbrook Research Institute. It has 110 patients. We filter them down to 70 by data quality because some of them doesn't have imaging, some of them missing cases. And uh, it, uh, it applies a technology called whole mount serial section. 
In plain words, it means that after the surgical removal of that lumpectomy, we would make blocks out of the lumpectomy. And by using this technology, we would have spatial information for every tumor nodule in every patient. Here are some stats of this cohort. All the patients are female, 10% of them had new chemotherapy before the surgery, and uh, the average age at diagnosis is 62, and the other two are um, in situ invasive distribution and uh, grid distribution. And the second one I would like to introduce is our experimental setup here. So by using histopathology, we are going to mark this tumor nodule on each block, that tissue block that we have. And here, the purple circle here is a uh, tumor nodule defined by pathologist. And in each tumor nodule, we are going to have four spatially closely uh, related to each other cores. And each copy of course is going to provide us one level of data. On DNA level, we are going to have genomic data by targeted sequencing. Uh, on RNA level, we are going to have our expression profiling by nanostring panel. At protein level, we are going to have eight protein markers by multiplex immunofluorescence analysis. And then on imaging level, we are going to have co-registration between the histopathology imaging and radiological imaging. So we would have spatial information for all four types of data. And then move to the second aim, uh, which is trying to integrate multiomics data with imaging data. That's what we call radiogenomics. Radiogenomics is a relatively new file. The figure on the left is a um, common work pipeline for radiogenomics. On the one hand, we would have imaging data, and on the other hand, we would have molecular profiling data. Radiogenomics here is trying to combine these two levels of data together and um, make some meaningful conclusions by using different uh, computational algorithms. Okay, so that's basically a snapshot of uh, our proposal and uh, moves to the next section, which is uh, progress. In this section, I'm going to let you know where I'm at right now. And uh, also I'm going to share several of my preliminary conclusions. Okay, so uh, to summarize this, pipe, uh, this timeline, we have finished 13 patients on RNA level, 21 patients on DNA level. We haven't started protein, uh, uh, we haven't started to do anything on protein level yet. We have a little bit preliminary data on imaging level. So we are at the middle stage of phase one right now. And then conclusion. The first one I would like to show you is on uh, RNA level. We are using this panel Breast Cancer 360 from Nanostring it has more than 700 genes, including PAM 50 gene signature, which is a subtyping signature in breast cancer. And they also have several immune signatures and other uh, signatures, gene signatures that's related to breast cancer. So, uh, and also the view shaped figure here is generated by Nanostring. Um, it's just a kind of small here, but is just trying to visualize the gene expression level. And also at the same time, it would provide us a, a molecular subtype of that tumor nodule. So this is the detailed profile for patient 91. We made three tumor nodule out of this patient. The first one is on block nine, second one on block 11, and the last one is on block 14. So from here, we can say that this patient has luminal A subtype on block nine and block 11, but she also has a luminal B subtype on block 14. So uh, why is this so important to us? Because uh, why went through the literature, one of the biggest interests on radiogenomics in breast cancer is that they are trying to predict molecular subtype from MRI, which is the radiological imaging type but they only have a moderate accuracy. So at that point, I was hypothesizing that their patient might have a mixture of molecular subtype, and that's why it's so hard for them to classify. And here we just approve this hypothesis. So that's the first conclusion. And then move to the second one, which is on DNA level. So we have ultra deep targeted sequencing data, which is perfect for phylogenetic analysis. Here I'm showing you the output of uh, phylogenetic analysis. I'm going to frame the figure first. The tree structure on the right here is a phylogenetic tree. It's 
the evolutionary relationship of the cancer specimen that we have. And the green circles are genetically distinct subforms. The numbers in the parentheses are cellular prevalence, which we can think of it as the percentage of the cells in a given sample that has this specific lineage. And it's in the order labeled here, sample one, two, three. Uh, for example, here, in subcode number four, there are 92% of cell in sample number one has this lineage. No cell in sample number two has this lineage. And all the cell in sample number three has this lineage. This is the tree of patient 91, who I mentioned in the previous slides. She has a mixture of luminal A and luminal B subtype uh, at the same time. I labeled the luminal B subtype odd, which is a pink one here, so that we can easily see it. So from here, we can make three conclusions. The first one is that luminal A and luminal B shared on common ancestor. That's pretty obvious because they only have one single primary clone. The second one would be luminal B is descended from luminal A. Yeah, in other words, luminal A is more ancestral compared to luminal B. We can see it from this specific lineage, 01467, because luminal B only appear in this lineage and it has a more recent clone, right? And um, the last conclusion I make is that when I look into this specific subclone number seven, it has a lot of mutations. It has, it has more than enough mutations. This patient only has 16 mutations after the filtering strategy, but this subclone has six mutations. So what I can say here is that luminal B has a more complex mutation profile compared to luminal A. And then after that, I tried to integrate our spatial information with the tree that I have. Uh, so the whole thing here is a lumpectomy from the patient. I zoomed it a lot so that we can see it. And then the gray and blue slides are the, lump, uh, are the blocks that we made out of lumpectomy. All of our samples are from the blue blocks, which is 9, 11, and 14. So according to our tree, this cancer was initiated on block number nine, and then a branch seeded on block 11 and 14. For some reason, this focus travels through all of these um, blocks and make, become a luminal B and seeded on uh, block number 14. So currently, we are trying to superimpose the vascular, ductal, and the lymphatic tissue system into this figure so that we can make more, his, more uh, meaningful story out of this um, local migrate history. And then another patient I would like to show you is patient 51, who has a mixture of in situ and invasive carcinoma. Um, it's basically the same kind of thing as the uh, previous slides. The only difference is that we have four samples instead of three samples this time. And I can make two conclusions out of this tree. The first one is that in situ and invasive carcinoma shared on common ancestor, uh, that's pretty obvious. And then the second one would be in situ carcinoma actually has a parallel branching pattern with invasive carcinoma. But we are not sure yet if it's saying that in situ came after the invasive or it just rapidly evolving by itself. But currently we, are, we designed several other assays to validate this uh, hypothesis. Okay, so that's the uh, summary of our progress so far. And uh, then jump to the future section. In this section, I'm going to tell you what we are doing right now and what plan do I have. So the first one is for our collaborator at uh, Sunnybrook Research Institute. They are, uh, as I mentioned before, they are trying to have make a higher resolution version of the 3D rendering so that we can have a meaningful local migration history. And then the second one was for me, I'm also trying to optimize and validating my fellow genetic analysis. I benchmarked several uh, tree algorithms. Uh, the one that I used was developed by uh, Jeff Wintersinger in um, Morris lab. That's the most suitable for this one. And then next for the plants. So um, the data acquisition is still in progress. And uh, on protein level, it's pretty straightforward. We have everything set up. We are just waiting for the tissue microarray. Uh, so all of my plants are basically on the radiological imaging level. Um, I'm planning to try both 
radiomics and raw images. Radiomics means that um, we extract numeric or category of features out of uh, raw images. And um, uh, on radiomics, it would be it would make sense to do several machine learning algorithms. The first one was um, manifold alignment, and the second one is similarity network. I won't try to describe those in detail, but you can ask me later if you are interested. And uh, the other important important thing I would say is that um, uh, creating labels. So by that I mean on multiomics level, on uh, let's say on protein level, we would have ER positive, ER negative, and that would be a binary label. We also have PR positive, PR negative. That's also binary label. We can also have multi-class label on, uh, let's say, RNA level. That would be molecular subtype. Lumina A, Lumina B, HER2 and basal, that's multi-class. And then we can also have multi-class label on um, genomic level uh, as a heterogeneity index, simply just counting the subclone in each sample. So once we have those labels, we can, the easiest way would be perform statistical tests. And then for raw images, we can have several data augmentation steps and then try to fit them into classifiers such as um, neural network or deep learning, and that would be uh, useful with our labels. So that's my plan for now. And then the last one is a review section. Uh, I would like to highlight one question here. I was, I, I was being asked, uh, this question was, should we expect more subclones if we took more samples or make more tumor nodules out of a patient? And then I try to um, plot, visualize this uh, correlation plot, and uh, it doesn't seem to have a high correlation, so we're fine with that. Because some of the patient has a lot of tumor nodules, some of them doesn't. And uh, um, the other three are for what's for my uh, community meeting, so I won't try to uh, explain it. Okay, so that's basically all of my um, presentation. Yeah. Uh,